My name is Rene Broyle. I'm a pastor of a church in Rome, Italy, which we started uh, 10 years ago. I was originally from Brazil, but uh, my wife and I moved there and uh, to start this uh, church in the university neighborhood of Rome. Rome has the largest university in Europe, so we wanted to start a church there. And, um, and it's been uh, wonderful just to think about God's faithfulness over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, many people got to know the Lord over these past years. Um, we've celebrated about, I think, 20, 71 baptism, uh, adult baptisms so far. So um, I thought of us sharing some of the lessons we've learned over the years, specifically in, when it comes to preaching and to sharing our faith with people who do not believe and not organizing debates with people uh, of other views. So uh, I'm assuming, that, of course, that our witnessing, our sharing of the faith, our preaching should be uh, biblical, should be Christ-centered, should be empowered by the Spirit. Um, but I found also that one aspect helps it a lot. Um, um, preaching and debating for contrast, helping contrast ideas. Because when we announce, uh, share our faith with people, sometimes it can feel like um, are predictable or remote from contemporary life. We say, for example, God loves you. And people think, yeah, sure, why not, right? Or we say, uh, uh, Jesus died for your sins. And people don't fully grasp the significance of those words. So um, how can our, um, our sharing of the faith uh, touch people today? How can we get people thinking? How can our, our gospel uh, touch people's hearts with vigor and with meaning? I found that one way is through presenting contrasts, by presenting opposites, by defining something, by showing what it is not. So let me start with an example. Um, we've heard so many times that Jesus taught, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Uh, then maybe we grew uh, uh, used to those words. They became kind of a cliche in our hearts. Uh, they lost their power. But our contrast might help. Here's one. Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, he disagreed with Jesus. He said, um, love your neighbor as your neighbor loves you. Uh, there should be reciprocity. I won't love you if you don't love me back. I will only give if I receive something in return. Interesting, eh? And then he expands this here uh, uh, in this way. If I love someone, he must deserve it in some way. He deserves it if he's so like me in important ways that I can love myself in him. And he deserves it if he's so much more perfect than myself that I can love my ideal of my own self in him. Isn't it interesting, right? He needs to repent. Uh, well, what do you guys think? He needs to repent. <laughs> he needs to repent. <laughs> welcome, welcome, good. Um, uh, yeah, we, we may not agree, of course, but the contrast gets us thinking, right? Um, what is love? Why should we love people who don't deserve it? Uh, how did Jesus want us to live? What did Jesus mean to love our neighbor? I found this contrast in this remarkable book, which uh, compares Freud's and C.S. Lewis's views of God, love, sex, uh, death, and other topics. I found the contrast very helpful. It gets us thinking. In the end, we still affirm, love your neighbor as yourself, as Jesus taught, but now with greater thoughtfulness. We thought uh, about the issues. We considered an alternative. And the greatness of Jesus' teaching shines even more. How beautiful it is to love my neighbor as I love myself. Not everybody agrees. Uh, and to love someone even when they don't deserve it and if I don't receive much in return. Okay. Um, and in this session, I want to cover um, four areas. And if you guys, I'll have them here, but you guys can also look up at the, at the app, the, the outline. So the biblical basis for this kind of ministry. Uh, how to include these principles in our preaching and speaking and sharing of the faith how to uh, take it further and organize debates with proponents of other views, uh, and the disciplines to help us nurture this practice of drawing contrasts. So the biblical braces, preaching for contrast, uh, holding debates, and how to grow in this area. So let me cover briefly the biblical basis, focusing on Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. The New Testament talks about several ministries of the word. There is like teaching authoritatively, there is exhorting for life change, there is prophesying, there is uh, witnessing, there is reading the scriptures, and we need all of them. The word comes alive when we practice all of them. Today we're gonna focus on the ministry of reasoning, persuading, and debating. And here are three passages where we see it taking place. The first happens when Paul uh, when, uh, arrives in uh, Jerusalem, not long after his conversion. 
So let's read. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated, and the root here is sunnesete, with the Hellenistic Jews. So Paul preaches in the synagogues, like he often does. He witnesses personally, but he also talks and debates with Greek-speaking Jews, which was something new, very fresh at the time for the church in Jerusalem. Then, later in life, he goes to Ephesus, the city where he spent most time, and started a church which probably became the mother church of, cities, uh, of churches in the surrounding region of, uh, of Laodicea, Smyrna, Colossus. You know those, those churches we find in the book of Revelation. And here we, we find this. He took the disciples with him and had discussions, dialogomenos, daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So Paul didn't just announce the gospel. Part of his ministry was also talking it out with seekers and with disciples, answering their questions, helping them understand the implications. There was public proclamation and discussions with individuals and with groups. In a passage where we see this kind of ministry in even more detail is the famous passage in Acts 17 when Paul arrives in Athens. Let me read this part. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned and he received both roots, the Allegato and Sunagone, in the synagogue with both Jews and Greek God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate, Sunebalon, with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seemed to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know what, this, what is this new teaching that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and would like to know what they mean. Luke uses both roots to show that Paul reasoned and engaged in the dialogue with people uh, he found in that city. He observes the idols of Athens. He reads the pagan literature uh, that he then quotes in his talk. And he notices points of continuity and of contrast. The altar to the unknown God, the Greek poets he builds on, right? And as a result, he's invited to speak at the Areopagus with, uh, because he first debates with the philosophers he finds in the marketplace. They are curious, they are puzzled, so they invite him to a public forum where Paul is able to announce the gospel. It's a very brief biblical survey, but it gives us some of the contours for this kind of ministry today. Paul addresses a pagan audience because he gets invited by some of their philosophers. He gets invited because he dialogues with them at the square, at the Agora. And he dialogues because he first studies the culture around him. So study, dialogue, and proclamation at the public forum. We need to pay attention to the songs that are being played, to the movies that are being watched, uh, the conversations that are held, and ask ourselves, why are people talking about that? Um, what do they want? What are they afraid of? Conversations with, with people, uh, our friends, is very helpful as well to discern this. And from this study, we'll discern forms of engagement. The more we do it, the more we might get invited to uh, do it in a non-Christian setting, uh, the local high school or association of neighbors, uh, the radio, the, a museum or another kind of setting. So let's talk about how to incorporate this into our uh, speaking and witnessing and preaching and teaching we might do in, uh, in groups, small groups, uh, the church or, or someplace else. We can start practicing even at church to a broadly Christian audience that might include a few non-believers. So here's a slide with uh, seven principles to do that, to address a double audience made of Christians and non-Christians, in which we affirm the presence of people who don't believe, we honor their intelligence, we address their concerns, we include their voices through paraphrase, we challenge their assumptions, and we quote authorities they respect. So the first uh, is um, recognize that we have a double audience made of both Christians and non-Christians. We should address both. To understand that we be, should be speaking both to people who already believe and to people who maybe are on the way there. Even if you know that everybody in the room is a believer, you know everybody's names, you know them, they're all believers. 
But if you um, start talking as if people who don't believe uh, are present, uh, people will, will think of their friends. They will think, oh, my friend should have heard of this. Um, maybe I'll invite him the next time. He'll come the next time. And they will create this, this culture of slowly um, building an environment which is for us and for our friends, in which people are, feel natural to invite their friends. In our church in Rome, most Sundays we have people visiting for the first time, often invited by their friends. It's a culture you slowly build. One practical way of doing that is um, by affirming their presence, the second principle, quite explicitly. You can tell them they're welcome. You can say, for example, some of us are here for the first time, um, and we don't know what we believe, or if we believe, or haven't thought much about God. And if that's your case, wonderful. I'm really glad you're here. You're so welcome in our midst. So we welcome them quite explicitly. And they feel like, oh, okay, I can, I, there's, a place, there's, there's, there's a place for me, for people like me here. We affirm their presence. So we recognize our double audience. We affirm their presence. The third principle is we honor their intelligence. Preaching today, uh, or at least traditionally, often feels top down, right? I, the holy preacher, I'm addressing you, lowly sinners. But, um, or we assume that people are not very smart, and we talk down to them and have, think we have to pressure them with um, force, with emotion, with guilt, with um, shame, with manipulation, right? Um, but when we do that, actually the opposite happens. We push people away. They take a step back. Because people are smart, and they don't want to be forced into anything. But when we honor their intelligence, uh, they lean in. They feel honored. They think, um, this guy thinks I'm smart. You know what? I am smart. I like this guy. People here should be, should be, must be smart too. Maybe I'll, I'll pay attention. They must have something good to say. Right? People rise up to that level. They feel honored. They turn on their brains. Uh, they pay attention because we honor them and they honor us. So fourth principle, also to address uh, people's concerns. Uh, for example, we can say, maybe you're thinking, this talk of love of neighbor sounds lovely, but uh, in the world I live in, it's brutal. Uh, try to be nice where I work. People will walk over you. Right? We voice an objection people might have, a concern, so, and they, they feel included as a consequence. They think, oh, you live in my world. You know what life feels like for me. What I just did, this example of including their voices in our own voice through paraphrase, is uh, the, next, uh, the next principle. Even if we are speaking the whole time, it feels a little bit like a dialogue because we're expressing their thoughts and dialoguing with those thoughts. We are paraphrasing what they may be thinking. For example, uh, uh, you can say, I know you mean well, but this is just not realistic to my life. Try to be nice with my, my roommate. The other day she did this. And then we interact with, the, with, that, uh, with that concern. We're paraphrasing an objection and giving voice to their voice through paraphrase. We do that uh, so we can arrive at the next principle, which, which is to challenge their assumptions. To, um, we gain their trust, we gain people's attention, and then we challenge the way they think and show uh, the difference to which, uh, from which we, we are trying to convey. In the example of loving our neighbor, we can say, for example, notice that I didn't equate love of neighbor with being nice. These are two different things. L being nice um, is a sentimental version of what Jesus meant by love of neighbor, which is, which is stronger and includes challenging them when necessary. In that case, you can say, roommates, I care about you. Uh, I want to have a good relationship with you. So what you did is not okay. That's love too, right? We challenge their assumptions. And here's a final principle. We can also quote authorities people respect before they come to accept the authority of scripture. It could be newspaper articles, it could be songs, it could be uh, statistics, even Lady Gaga. Let me give you guys this example. I remember two teenagers who used to come to church drive by their parents. I used to sit in the back kind of making fun of the whole thing. Um, one day I was talking about sin. And I quoted a song by Lady Gaga. So let me give you this example. Uh, she sings this. I'm just a holy fool. Oh, baby, it's so cruel. But I'm still in love with Judas, baby. 
She thinks about being in love with the wrong guy, with a traitor. Further into the song, she sings, When he calls to me, I am ready. I'll wash his feet with my hair if he needs to. It's very strong imagery for sin, for desecration, for being unable to overcome our destructive attachments. But at one point, she also thinks, Jesus is my virtue. Judas is a demon I cling to. That's powerful, powerful, right? To know what is right, but to still do what is wrong. It's a picture of sin. To know that Jesus is my virtue, but to cling to a demon. Lady Gaga is doing the preaching here. We can affirm the good things she says, but also challenge what she gets wrong. In the, uh, in the, for example, in the song she also sings, In the most biblical sense, I am beyond repentance. Fame hooker, prostitute wench, vomits her mind. That's not right. Precisely in the most biblical sense, nobody is beyond repentance or salvation. We may reach bottom, we may love the wrong guy, we may cling to a demon, but Jesus is still mighty to save. Jesus died even for those sins. He can liberate us from our demons and become our virtue. Right? It's the illustration I use in that sermon. And the teenagers in the back whisper um, among themselves, Oh, Lady Gaga. Uh, and they let in, uh, paid attention, and from that day were a bit happier to come to church and later give their lives to the Lord and were baptized. Right? Uh, the contrast got them thinking. Uh, a singer they knew caught their attention. She voiced their concerns through, uh, in very strong language. It wasn't a preacher talking about those terrible sinners out there, uh, uh, about their sin, but quoting a sinner confessing her sin. So we could find points of continuity and of contrast. Yes, Jesus is our virtue. She got that right. But no, none of us is beyond repentance. Jesus can save you. Jesus can liberate you from your demons. It could have been like maybe a sermon in which we talk about sin and, and push people away, right? But the contrast gets people thinking and draws them in. Let me give you a couple other examples, different kinds of examples. Here's one that relates to uh, Paul's speech in Acts 17, the, one, the passage we saw. Maybe when I quoted that passage, you thought, uh, oh, that's kind of predictable, right? To quote uh, Paul in Acts 17 to talk about preaching and apologetics. Um, and if you thought that, you're right. It's very predictable. Good, good thoughts, good thoughts, yes. But here's a contrast that might uh, provide some fresh perspective. Did you know that Nietzsche, the, the atheist philosopher, wrote a prayer to the unknown God? It's fascinating. He was 20 at the time. Let me, let's read this prayer. Once more, before I move on and set my sights ahead, in loneliness I lift my hands up to you, you to whom I flee, to whom I, in the deepmost depth of my heart, solemnly consecrated altars so that ever your voice may summon me again. Deeply graved into those altars glows the phrase to the unknown God. I am His. I'll know I have, until now, also linger amid the unholy mob. I am His, and I feel the snares that pull me down in the struggle, and if I will flee, compel me yet into His service. I want to know you, unknown one, who reaches deep into my soul, who roams through, roams through my life like a storm, you unfathomable one, Akin to me, I want to know you, even serve you. Isn't it powerful? Uh, it shows what could feel remote and distant. And the ancient Greeks building an altar to the unknown God feel a bit closer to us. One of the most aggressive atheists of history, wrestling with, with his unbelief, craving the God he was fleeing from, praying to an unknown God, like people today, like pray like, God, if you're out there, help me, right? Here's a third example uh, of a contrast that helps us examine cultural assumptions and contrast them with the biblical view of life and of love. This is a magazine cover of an Italian magazine, the Italian uh, edition of Cosmopolitan magazine. Let me show you. There you go. It's in Italian, but I put some translations here uh, in the margins. The first message we see here on this cover is, um, is about sexuality. Um, to love is to make love. Love equal, equals sex. So, 101 hot and sexy moves. Try all of them, guaranteed fun, is the first message. The second one conveys a technical approach to life, focus on techniques. So, um, are you a freelance? Infallible tips to get you paid on time. And then there's an emphasis on physical beauty. 
Beauty Special, the total guide for sexy hair, pop makeup, and a selfie face. And then the crisis that grows out of that, which is um, to the right, we aren't a couple, but we are making love. What are we? Good question, right? What are we? That's the, the crisis that arises out of those assumptions, right? Um, on sexuality, on, um, on physical, what, what is uh, beauty, a technical approach to life. We are identifying cultural assumptions, helping people notice and reflect about what is around them. Like go to a newsstand and observe the covers, right? And the messages that are being conveyed. And then contrast those with the Christian view of uh, love, of the body, uh, of life. Like Paul, we are studying the culture and the idols around us. We observe what is going on. We read pagan literature. We notice points of continuity and of contrast. And we help people see the beauty of the Christian worldview as a, as a consequence. So that's it. That was uh, the second part. So um, we did a brief biblical survey. We talked about our principles for uh, sharing and uh, communicating our faith using contrasts. Um, let me talk about talking this further and sharing some uh, stories about holding debates with people, uh, proponents of other views. Preaching in Christian settings is wonderful. We need it, and it builds up the people of God. But like Paul, we also need to take the gospel out. Um, so let me share some of my story of how I, I um, was forced into this area. It first happened when I was uh, in high school and had a professor of philosophy, which was um, an agnostic who had lost his faith. And he wanted to help me. So he brought a number of arguments to try to um, help me lose my faith like it had happened to him. Uh, it was, um, he was very eloquent, very thoughtful. I could not uh, answer him back. And, uh, and he pretty much dis- demolished my faith uh, back then. Um, but in God's providence, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me and to my faith. Because it led me back to the books, to the Bible, uh, to discover like a li- good literature, and to begin to find one argument that could answer him. Then another one. And to start to debate him, debate him in class and see that some of his arguments did not add up, then another, and then really gain confidence that my faith had firm grounds. We could, um, I could come to an adult sort of faith, not just rely on the faith I received from my parents and from the church. So uh, I had this with very informal sessions during class, trying to debate with him and survive those philosophy classes. Then I went to university, uh, and one professor of psychology he, um, he was an atheist as well, and he gave us um, to read uh, Sigmund Freud, which uh, not just the more psychological part, but also his atheism, what he tries to convey, convey in his book. It was another season for me to wrestle with that, uh, think, and uh, try to answer his, his objections. And then we had a local um, group of a Bible study group in our university, a chapter. And we thought, let's do a debate. Let's invite him and talk with him about the, what, what he's teaching, right? So we invited him. It was our most attended event. The, the classroom was filled. And um, he presented uh, his views on God is a human projection. And I talked about uh, God not being, I gave being a, our creator. Um, and it was fascinating. I was, of course, very nervous. I was still a student. But people, um, even if they don't didn't, um, I believe, like we did, uh, they appreciated the courage and the, the occasion, right, to have people debating and, and talking about the topic. Then when uh, my wife and I moved to Rome, Italy, uh, to plant a church and work uh, with the university students, we thought, let's organize debates here as well. Sorry, where was this country now? Oh, sorry, I grew up in Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yes, that was in Sao Paulo, yes. Then we moved to Rome in 2010. In 2012, we contacted the Italian Union of Atheists and proposed debates about the existence of God. Uh, and they said, we're up for it. Uh, we'd love to do that. They seem very confident, right? So here are some pictures of those debates. We did two. There is this uh, literary cafe, this place here uh, indoors, and that's their president. And uh, Rome has the largest university in Europe, right? So we did on campus in the open air. So that group over there, there, and this one is the, is the debate with a professor uh, of theirs uh, in that week. And uh, it was fascinating just to um, how people relished um, uh, a dialogue in which different viewpoints were presented. In, uh, it, uh, our, our own Christian people found it much easier to invite a friend to a public forum where different voices, different views would be uh, voiced 
and not just like come to church, re, uh, listen to a sermon, for example, right? So it was a stepping stone for them. And many people uh, came to hear and a few gave their names then to, to know more about the Christian faith at the end. So it was very good, uh, very interesting exercise. Um, then we thought, what next could we, could we do? I thought we could invite a, a Buddhist group, right? Let's have a dialogue with them. So I contacted the largest uh, Buddhist group in Italy. And they um, were kind of uh, reticent at first. Is it like, a, who are you? What do you want? But I had to have a few meetings with them to like, so they could uh, gain trust. And okay, we can do an event and talk. I proposed um, a debate, uh, a conversation about the meaning of life. The Buddhist and the Christian view of the meaning of life. And there you go. It was the second uh, uh, disorder debate we did there in the, in the same venue. Uh, the Buddhist professor, I, and the, a Buddhist moderator. Uh, a girl who did a very good job. Half of the group was Buddhist, half of the group was, were Christians. And uh, it was fascinating, just ask, asking questions. Oh, I didn't put uh, the picture here, but uh, one story out of that was a guy who was uh, kind of getting um, interested in Oriental philosophies. He used to work for a Buddhist uh, publisher. And invited by a Buddhist friend came, but at the end gave his name and came to our uh, secret Bible study. And then gave his life to the Lord, was baptized, studied theology, and uh, was an example of someone who came out of that event. Those events are often, um, they're good events in itself, but even more as a stepping stone for, to invite someone to that and then to try to walk with the person after, right? The final one we did was um, with, a, with, a, with the Muslims in, uh, in Rome. R Rome has the largest mosque in Europe. They, they built it there. Uh, so... Um, I, I wrote them a, an email and got no response. I wrote them on Facebook and got no response. I went then to hand out a, a written letter and uh, I got no response. Uh, but my wife, uh, who used to work with the university students, she uh, at, at one point has a few uh, Muslim girls who wanted to know about the, uh, the Bible's view of Jesus because Jesus is a prophet in Islam, right? So they remain Muslim, but they wanted to know and uh, understand a little bit of the Bible. So uh, Sarah said, try Habiba. She, she, she will know who to contact. So I wrote her on Facebook. And five minutes later, she wrote me back. I know, I know the right person. I'll put you in contact with him. And then we did uh, our debate, which was uh, this one here. Uh, with, the, with this guy over here, uh, I. And um, this, other, uh, uh, this very good friend uh, who's also a pastor at a church, Mila, wanted to have a, a woman moderating the debate as well. And that's one of my favorite pictures, a guy who's a very expansive, uh, he's, a, and he, um, uh, he's an artist, and he's just talking, and kind of almost like hugging the Muslims, like a, a good picture of what Christians do, right? We create dialogue uh, in which we tell the truth, we're, we don't shy away from it, but in a respectful and loving way, which I think uh, conveys um, the, the spirit, the Christian spirit we want to have in those interactions with people of, of, of other views, which is... Um, we can say, like Jesus, like uh, uh, chapter 1 of John, uh, we embody grace and truth. They go together. One needs the other. It can be just grace, uh, and in, we, in which we might ri fa risk falling into everything's okay, we're all the same, we're all brothers and sisters, all religions lead to, lead to God, right? It can be that. Nor can it be just truth um, without love and respect which risks being um, angry, heavy, crushing, and pushes people away. But when we combine grace and truth, we embody the spirit of Jesus. Grace and truth are transformative. They invite people in and challenge them with love. We don't need to be wishy-washy. We have to present what we, what we really believe. But we don't need to be harsh and critical of the other side either. We can just present the Christian faith alongside another viewpoint with clarity and with respect. And people will see that Christianity is more winsome than anything else, right? Um, in the example, for example, um, the debate with the Muslims, I talked about the difference of the doctrine of, of God, of the uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and Tahid, the, the, the oneness of God, the doctrine of God is one, right? And so, and they felt very respected by that. They appreciated, like, a, you're not saying we all believe in the same God. You recognize the differences. At the same time, um, it came to a point, our, our topic was, uh, how can religion be a force for peace in the world today? In which I, I mentioned the Crusades in the Middle Ages. And I said, I'm not anyone um, to 
say that, but uh, I want to say, like, uh, I'm so sorry about the Crusades in the Middle Ages. What the Christians did are not okay, and I apologize for that. They were really, really touched by that. They almost cried. The guy who was debating with me, the others weren't present. It was really touching for them. To, um, because it's a central wound for many from whom our, our witch comes, like uh, some, uh, um, some uh, reticence towards the West, right? So, um, so depending on which we recognize our differences, we convey love, and people can understand one viewpoint, another viewpoint, and come to terms with what they believe. So um, here's a final, uh, couple final slides on how to organize these kind of events if I might ever want to do that in, a, in, our, in our settings. And that might be like organized events like that. It might be um, uh, conversations among friends, like uh, informal evenings or something. Um, I gave this, this, this workshop uh, yesterday to the apologetics track, and a guy talked about doing something like a, with a Muslim uh, YouTube channel and they had a conversation, it was a very interesting approach. So, um, so identify a team and a conversation partner. So I want to talk about the meaning of life. With whom could I talk that? And you uh, make an invitation out of that. There'll be a process to establish trust if you don't know them. So uh, in, in those cases, I had to meet people a few times so they could uh, see who we were, what our heart was. Uh, oh, I can trust these people. They will be fair, they will be honest, it will be respectful um, and then you organize uh, the, the the event if you want to do it in our case we chose uh, neutral places um, and um, and chose a format in which would uh, be productive right uh, in our format we had three times with three moments in which each of us presented their view on, on that topic then the other person could respond to what what the other said and then we open to questions and answers and talk with the audience. And it was a good way of uh, structuring and having a good conversation which had a beginning and an end, uh, which people interacted. So uh, you may choose um, a different format, but uh, we found that helpful. And then you follow up with interested people. Uh, you give a, like, you give a form like, uh, what do you think of this event? Would you like to know more about Christianity, about atheism or Buddhism, etc.? And then and you are really honest. If people said oh, Buddhism, you give them the, those contexts. And then you follow up with people who might be interested more in, in the Christian faith. And uh, final slide. So a few practices to nurture this art, this practice of, uh, of interacting with people, right? With uh, reasoning with people. As I mentioned, observation. Just like go to the movies and see what are the movies what, what being, being made right now. And now we have so many superhero movies, right? And ask, why are, why are people watching so many superhero movies? Why is that the case? What are, what are they looking for? Or pay attention to the songs in the radio, to the newsstand, the magazines that are there. Um, watch TV and, uh, and see why are they talking about those topics? Why are these, these formats being, being made in TV today? Or um, you pay attention and reflect about it. Then uh, to have a diverse cultural diet in which we read Christians and non-Christians. People from our country and people from other countries. Men and women. Like we try to have a diverse cultural diet in which we um, try to get in contact with what people are thinking and engaging with today. Here, for example, a couple of uh, examples of uh, uh, philosophers, atheist philosophers, which are very interesting, with which I could have uh, find a few points of contrast, those two names. You can read fiction like uh, Tolstoy, Jane Austen, Dostoevsky, many other authors which are very interesting to engage with. Uh, and learn from uh, Christians who practice that, like Tim Keller is a good example. For a few years, I and a group of friends, we uh, organized a community blog uh, called wanderingfair.com in which we did articles engaging movies, uh, songs, um, trends. You know, like, there are some good articles, good ideas there as well. Uh, that one is, was a Jewish rabbi who was very good at doing this from a Jewish perspective. The book I mentioned in the beginning. So a few resources if you want to grow into this area uh, and practice that.